Good evening. Uh, welcome, everybody. Leon van Rensburg, RSA Congress Director. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all again to the seventh lecture in our Head and Neck series, um, presented by uh, Dr. Richard Wiggins III from the University of Utah and Salt Lake City. Um, by this time, you're all aware of his illustrious uh, CV. And I just, again, want to thank Rick for making his time available to us. And um, we really appreciate it. The lecture will be approximately 45 minutes. And then there will be opportunity to, to um, log uh, questions on the email inbox. I also want to remind or rather bring to your attention that the American Association of Head and Neck Radiology annual meeting will take place in Scottsdale, Arizona from the 2nd to the 6th of October this year. It's an excellent meeting. Um, there is preferential registration rates for uh, registrants outside of the USA and uh, Dr. Wiggins uh, will send me some details on that for those of you who have leave or can make it uh, and have American visas I strongly advise you to attend this meeting and without any further delay over to you Rick thank you very much thank you uh, yeah, we do. Uh, for people uh, from non-North America, outside of North America, we have a heavily discounted uh, rate if you're interested for ASHNR. So uh, today we're going to talk about, we're going to start a discussion about skull base, and I'm going to start off talking about the central skull base and this very complicated area uh, and uh, how we think about this anatomy. Like everything else in head and neck, uh, we'll talk about the anatomy here first, and then we'll talk about the pathology that happens to the anatomy. And this is very important here in the central skull base because this is an area where if we pay attention to both the CT and the MRI studies, if we have a bone algorithm CT and a non-contrasted MRI, this is a place where we can sometimes uh, say exactly what the diagnosis is. That's something that's very powerful for us on our imaging studies. So we wanna pay very close attention to that when we do have that opportunity. Uh, so we wanna understand both the CT and the MRI studies and how those are similar and how they help each other and recognize some of the more common pathologies that we see around the central skull base and understand the imaging characteristics of that pathology. So I'm gonna have this discussion around an unknown case. Uh, so we had this unknown uh, patient, so they had a central skull base lesion come in, came in and we did a CT on this patient and we did an MR. So this is their T1 image. So we see this large lesion of the central skull base. And we also did, a, we gave the patient contrast. So here's the post-contrast at T1. And we had a T2 image through there. And we also did a routine sagittal. So we did a workup of this central skull base lesion. And this is an unknown case presentation. Now, sometimes in radiology and in imaging, we see something and we can guess immediately what this is, or we just recognize very quickly what the pathology is. Uh, but other times, like in this case, we really have to think about the different imaging anatomy and pathology that we see around here. And we go through a long thought process and we use logic and rationality to try to get to the right answer. So they had this unknown case and they dictated a note on it. Uh, so they dictated a very long report. This is the report they dictated on this case. And uh, I didn't edit this or copy and paste it in any way. This is the actual report. It, it kind of went on and on. And I sat down and they had a long impression and I looked over the report and the impression with the fellow, and we kind of discussed all these different things. So this was their long report that they did. And I tried to look and focus on the different pathologies that they included in the impression. And I thought that that list was kind of interesting because their differential list looked a lot like the differential that I used for this central skull base talk. And I had just given this lecture and given these slides to this uh, one fellow a couple of weeks beforehand. Uh, but it was a great example of how we sat down and we went through the case and we talked about all these differentials. 
and how this pathology affects that anatomy. And it was a way that we can get to the right case, to the right answer. Uh, so I sat down and I went through the case and I went through their impression with the fellow. And then I told them why I thought it was uh, the differential, the one thing that uh, I included in, in my differential when I looked at it from all of their differentials that they included in their case. But it was a great discussion of this different area. So we can think about vague areas like the anterior skull base, the central skull base, and the posterior skull base as wide areas for differentials. Or we can think about the individual bones with the unpaired ethmoid in the sphenoid bone and the occipital bone in the midline. And then we have the paired frontal bones, the parietal bones, and the temporal bones off to the side. So I'm gonna talk about and focus on this area for the central skull base discussion. So for the anterior skull base, we sometimes have pathology from the sinuses or from the orbits come up intracranially or from the nasal vault come up through the cribriform plate. And when we talk about the posterior fossa, we have the foramen magnum and we have the jugular foramen, but the central skull base is this very complicated area that's kind of in between those other regions. And we think about this anatomy very differently. And we also remember that below, when we're thinking about the skull base from below, that central skull base has all these various bones that contribute to the central skull base. And we have all these complicated foramen where we have all these cranial nerves that pass through that area. So again, we have several different bones that contribute specifically here to the central skull base where we have the sphenoid, the ethmoid, and part of the occipital bones that all contribute to that area that we talk about as the central skull base. So both CT and MRI are often performed here. And this is an area where if I have a CT with bone algorithm, I sometimes recommend an MR. And if I started off with an MR, I sometimes recommend a CT. And I don't feel bad about that because I know that if I have both a bone algorithm CT, usually without contrast, just to look at the osseous changes and a contrasted MRI to look for soft tissue. If I have both of these studies, I can sometimes tell you exactly what the pathology is most likely to be. So that's a very powerful thing for us to be able to do on imaging. And again, we have all these cranial nerves that are going through that area. So cranial nerve one is going through the cribriform plate where we think about the anterior skull base, but around the central skull base, we have a lot of cranial nerves going through all of these foramen. So we have all of these 12 cranial nerves that come out different foramen around the skull base. And again, we think about those central foramen, uh, the central cranial nerves five through eight, having their foramen and central cranial nuclei that originate in the pons, and a lot of their foramen come out in the central skull base. So we have these different areas. So the central skull base, we think about this region kind of on both sides of the cella with the greater and lesser wing of the sphenoid. So we have an anterior skull base and we have a posterior skull base. And the most complicated there is the central skull base in this region. So I'm gonna focus this discussion here on this area. But a lot of the pathology that we'll talk about is something that can apply to the anterior or the posterior skull base. So we have the uh, central area where the pituitary is in the Turkish saddle, the cell of Turkica, and we have the uh, greater and lesser wing of the sphenoids that contribute to the central skull base in that area with all of these cranial nerves, most importantly, cranial nerve five that we talked about before coming out its foramen. So here's the cella tersica, so the Turkish saddle where the pituitary gland sits itself with its infundibulum, and we have variable aeration of the sphenoid below the cella itself. So we think about the cella there is where the pituitary gland is sitting around that central skull base in this complex anatomy. And we have an anterior clinoid process uh, that extends off the lesser wing of the sphenoid anterior to the pituitary gland, and we have a posterior clinoid process that's coming posterior laterally off the dorsum cellae, and that's the attachment for the tentorium cere uh, cerebelli posteriorly. And then we have the chiasmatic uh, sulcus that's just posterior and inferior from the platum sphenoidale, and that's where we think about the optic chiasm is. Uh, so cranial nerve two and the optic nerve that comes off here, we think about as being special. Cranial nerve two never has a transition from the central to peripheral myelinization. So cranial nerve two gets its own uh, hole through the optic nerve canal. Uh, but also we think about a lot of pathology that happens to the brain is happening to the second cranial nerve. So we can get optic nerve meningiomas, optic nerve gliomas, and optic neuritis uh, 
all pathologies that we talk about with cranial nerve two that we don't really talk about with the other cranial nerves. So the tuberculum cella again is that uh, margin of the cella tersica uh, that we think about. So we have the pituitary gland sitting here at this area and the central midline portion of the central skull base. Now we have a lot of foramen and fissures that are very complicated from the central skull base. So we want to go through that anatomy first, and then we'll talk about the pathology that happens both to that anatomy and around it. So first, as we said, we have the optic nerve. So the optic nerve gets its own hole. It has its own optic nerve canal. So we have cranial nerve two, and that extends along that course with some dura. So we sometimes have prominent CSF that travels along with the second cranial nerve. And that canal is formed by the lesser wing of the sphenoid, and that's superior and medial to the supraorbital fissure. So we think about that canal right here. So here's the optic nerve canal where the optic nerve is going. And at the level of the optic nerve canal, if we look laterally, we see a cleft between the greater and lesser wing of the sphenoid. That's the supraorbital fissure. So all the cranial nerves that are going to the orbit, cranial nerves three, four, V1, and six, all we think about passing through that supraorbital fissure on both sides. And again, that's a cleft between the greater and lesser wing of the sphenoid at that level. So here is the supraorbital fissure. And again, we find that cleft at the level of the optic nerve canal. So if I find the globe and I find where the optic nerve hits the globe and I follow the optic nerve back, I'm gonna find the optic nerve canal. And at that level, laterally, I'm gonna see the supraorbital fissure. Now there's also an inferior orbital fissure down inferior to that level. We have the inforbital artery, vein, and nerve that pass through that. And that's a cleft between the body of the maxilla anteriorly and the greater wing of the sphenoid laterally. So that's the inferior orbital fissure at that level. So here's the inferior orbital fissure more inferiorly. And we see where that is at the level of rotundum where V2 is passing through. So next we have the carotid canal. So we have the internal carotid artery and the sympathetic plexus that we might discuss with Horner syndrome. Uh, that sympathetic plexus that we sometimes discuss with Horner's, uh, if we discuss if it's preganglionic or postganglionic, the ptosis, meiosis, and anhydrosis that are associated with that Horner syndrome. And this is formed by the greater wing of the sphenoid and the temporal bone. Uh, that's the horizontal segment of the carotid there. And the carotid canal is the opening more inferiorly. So here's that carotid canal inferiorly. And we know the horizontal segment of the carotid is extending up uh, anteriorly and medially from there. So frame and rotundum is where we think about cranial nerve V2 going through. So the second division of the trigeminal nerve V2 is going through frame and rotundum right here. That's at the level of the inferior orbital fissure. Uh, that is completely within the sphenoid bone and it's superior and lateral to the pterygoid or vidian canal. And that's a direct connection from the horizontal segment of the carotid over to the pterygopalatine fossa. So that's the frame and rotundum where V2, the second division of the trigeminal nerve is extending through. So here's a ma more magnified view there of frame and rotundum uh, that is extending forward to the inforbital fissure and the pterygopalatine fossa. And we see that near the level of the horizontal segment of the carotid. Now frame and ovale, we see near this level. So cranial nerve V3 is going through frame and ovale. And we also have the accessory meningeal branch of the maxillary artery. This is completely within the greater wing of the sphenoid. And it's a direct connection from the intracranial vault and the trigeminal cistern or Meckel's cave inferiorly to the masticator space. Uh, now, posterior and lateral to that uh, from foramen ovale is foramen spinosum. So that's where the middle meningeal artery and vein are. And we think about a small meningeal branch of V3. That's completely also within the greater wing of the sphenoid here laterally. So this is the high-heeled footprint that we talk about of the skull base. So there's an oval part of the footprint, that's ovale, and the spine of the shoe is spinosa. So if I find the TMJ in the condylar head and I find its medial portion, if I go a centimeter medial and a centimeter anterior, that's where I find V3. And that's the high-heeled footprint of the skull base. We often see near the level of rotundum, where V2 is going through. So V3 is going through a valley, and we think about the middle meningeal artery going through spinosum. So here to help you with the high heel footprint, here is a high heel. So the oval part of the heel footprint is a valley, and the spine of the shoe right here is spinosum. So that's how we remember that high heeled footprint 
of the skull base. Here is Foramen ovale and spinosum in snow. For those of you in Africa who don't get a lot of snow, here in Utah, we get snow. Someone else made this for me, not me. But we can remember again that ovale part where V3 is going through and spinosum where the middle meningeal artery is going through. So next we have foramen lacerum, not a true foramen, but we think about it as very thin cartilaginous bone near the horizontal segment of the carotid. And we look very closely at this area, especially when we think about nasopharyngeal carcinoma or lymphoma or minor salivary gland carcinomas from the nasopharynx going up intracranially. So when we find the horizontal segment of the carotid and we go more inferiorly to that level, we find foramen lacerum. So that's near the level of the pterygoid or vidian canal. It's near the high heeled footprint. So here's V3 with ovale and the middle meningeal artery is going through spinosum. This is foramen lacerum, uh, not a true foramen, but we think about a very thin area of the central skull base where pathology from the nasopharynx may go up intracranially. That's foramen lacerum. So that pterygoid or vidian canal is at that level going anteriorly and laterally. So we have a long, thin curvilinear canal that goes from the horizontal segment of the carotid anteriorly towards the pterygopalatine fossa. So that's transmitting the pterygoid artery and nerve, and that's formed by the sphenoid bone, and it is inferior and medial to rotundum where cranial nerve V2 is going through. So here's that long, thin curvilinear pterygoid or vidian canal that goes forward to the pterygopalatine fossa. So same thing in the coronal plane. Uh, when we're near the level of the nasopharynx and the airway, we see frame and lacerum uh, medially adjacent to the sphenoid bone. As we go lateral to that, we see where cranial nerve V3 goes in. So sometimes when we're at the level of the torus tuberius of the nasopharynx, that's near where V3 should be coming down uh, through ovale. And again, we find that condylar head of the TMJ. And from the medial portion of the condylar head, if we go a centimeter medial and a centimeter anterior, that's where foramen ovale is. Uh, so as we go more anteriorly to that in the coronal view, here's foramen rotundum. So that's where V2 is going through when we see the level of the pterygoid plates. So here's the medial and lateral pterygoid plates. So that's where we see rotundum. And inferior and medial to that is where we see the pterygoid or vidian canal. So that's a long, thin curvilinear canal in the axial plane. And in the coronal plane, we see this canal inferior and medial to rotundum. Uh, now, that leads anteriorly to the pterygopalatine fossa. This is a very important way station of the deep face, and we have all these connections. And this is a very important area when we're thinking about perineural tumor spread at this level. So the pterygopalatine fossa is this very important way station of the deep face for perineural tumor spread. So here in this graphic, we see cranial nerve uh, 5 that we talked about before, with V3 going down inferiorly through a valley, VT, V2 going forward through rotundum, and V1 going up through that superorbital fissure and then superior to the globe itself in the orbit. So this pterygopalatine fossa where V2 is extending up is a direct communication between the middle cranial fossa, the nasal cavity, goes down towards the junction of the heart and soft palate with the palatine canal and connects to the masticator space out laterally. So when we're thinking about perineural tumor spread in the head and neck, we're usually talking about cranial nerve five and seven, and the perineural tumor spread that happens around the pterygopalatine fossa is very important when we're thinking about cranial nerve V2 in patients who may have numbness on their cheek. So here's that pterygopalatine fossa. So we think about the inferior and superorbital fissure going towards the orbit. We have the sphenopalatine foramen and life covered with mucosa, but we have a hole superiorly and posteriorly in the nasal vault that connects the nasal vault to the pterygopalatine fossa. Out laterally, we have the pterygomaxillary fissure that goes to the masticator space. We have this little thin palatine canal that goes down towards the junction of the hard and soft palate, and there's a greater and lesser palatine uh, foramen that extend down there. And we have rotundum and the pterygoid that connect back intracranially. So here's the pterygoid or vidian canal that is a long, thin curvilinear canal that may connect the pterygopalatine fossa back posteriorly towards the horizontal segment of the carotid. And we have the pterygomaxillary fissure laterally that connects the pterygopalatine fossa to the infrazygomatic masticator space or just masticator space in the superhighway neck here out laterally. So we always want to see fat there at the pterygopalatine fossa 
And if we've replaced that fat and the fat behind the maxillary sinus, sometimes called the retromaxillary fat pad, we're suspicious of perineural tumor spread in that area. So this is an area, again, where the pre-contrasted T1 is sometimes more helpful than the post-contrasted. So this is that same pterygopalatine fossa. We see a little ganglia within there, but we like to see nice bright fat on the pre-contrasted T1. Nose is dark here, so this is before contrast, the nose nose, and we see the retromaxillary fat pad. We see the pterygomaxillary fissure. We see the pterygopalatine fossa. We see the sphenopalatine foramen. We see the normal bright fat in the pterygoid plates. So when we're thinking about perineural tumor spread, we look very closely at the pterygopalatine fossa to see if we've replaced the normal bright fat at this level. Again, here is the condylar head of the TMJ. So if I find its medial part, if I go a centimeter medial and a centimeter anterior, that's gonna be V3 coming down below ovale. So it's a little harder to find ovale sometimes on MRI. So if we remember that relationship to the condylar head, just go a centimeter medial and a centimeter anterior, that's gonna be V3. We wanna see normal bright fat before contrast around V3. And we remember that we have these blood vessels around it. There's a pterygoid venous plexus that's just medial to the lateral pterygoid. And that's a common pseudomass. We see all these blood vessels that are around V3 below ovale. So it sometimes looks like there's a lot of enhancement around V3 under ovale, that's okay, but we shouldn't see enhancement of the nerve itself, V3 as it comes out below ovale. So that pterygoid venous plexus is a common pseudomass around the masticator space that we often see just medial to the lateral pterygoid. So this is the lateral pterygoid that goes from the lateral pterygoid plate over to the condylar neck below the TMJ. So that's the anatomy that we think about with the central skull base. So now we'll spend the rest of our time looking at this pathology. Now, a lot of these are very similar, and we might think about a big differential for a marrow replacing process around the skull base, whether it's anterior, central, or posterior. But there's a couple of these pathologies that if we pay attention to how they look on both CT and MRI, we can sometimes make a much more specific differential diagnosis than just listing all of these pathologies in that case. So when there is a difference, we want to be sure we pay attention to that. Now, there are some of these things that evolve the bone in different ways. So we may be destroying bone with a little bit of normal bone left behind, or we may have a pathology that's actually making a matrix for these cases. And it's sometimes hard to differentiate between those. So when we can tell the difference between these pathologies, we want to pay attention to that. Because again, if we have a well-done bone algorithm CT, thin section, and we have a contrasted MR, sometimes we can guess the pathology. Now, we want to pay attention first to pseudomasses. So we mentioned that pterygoid venous plexus that's below the skull base. Another thing that we often see is these benign fibrofatty lesions. Sometimes these are described as arrested pneumatization. Uh, I like to think of these similar to the hemangioma we often see within vertebral bodies. And if we think about the basi sphenoid and clivus, and you look at the vertebrate anatomy literature, it turns out that this area is thought of embryologically as very similar to a vertebral body. So it makes sense that we have these lesions incidentally in the basi sphenoid and clivus, similar to what we find in the vertebral bodies. We see fat density, we see thickened trabeculae and corticated margins. We think about these as benign fibrofatty lesions of the skull base. Uh, and again, we see these very commonly around this area. Here's another case. And we want to remember that if I zoom in, if I just measure Hounsfield units of this uh, lesion, if I find some negative, like negative 40 or 50 or 100, I know that that's fat. This is a benign fibrofatty lesion. It does not need to be followed up. It does not need to be resected. We see a thickened trabeculae and corticated margin around the outside. And we want to remember all the time, this is a CT scanner. It's just a big, stupid densometer. So we're measuring densities of tissues. Air is white, uh, uh, air is uh, not dense, so that's black. Bone is white, so that's very dense. Everything else is in between. If I measure Hounsfield units, and if it's negative 40 or 50 or 100, that's fat. That's just an incidental fibrofatty lesion of the skull base. We often see those around the basi sphenoid and clivus. Now, sometimes we look at pathology and it makes a big difference if we start with a CT or an MRI. So here's a lesion that we had on MRI. 
here's a pre-contrasted T1 and here's the post-contrasted. And it looked like it was an osseous lesion that was maybe expansile, very strange heterogeneous enhancement within this lesion. So we started thinking about a lot of very different carcinomas and aggressive pathologies for this case. But if we had started with a CT, we might have thought very differently about this pathology as a fibrous dysplasia. This is a relatively common lesion around this area, and we like to see the ground glass matrix and expansile changes on CT. But it can have a very strange MRI appearance with intense avid heterogeneous enhancement in both bright and dark areas on T2. Now, if we had started with a CT and we saw the ground glass and we saw the expansile nature of this lesion, we would see this and immediately say, oh, that's ground glass, it's expansile, it's narrowing some of those foramen we discussed. That's a great appearance for fibrous dysplasia. It's pretty easy to differentiate that on CT. Now, sometimes it's not all ground glass and expansile. We may have cystic areas and we may have more sclerotic regions of a case that may be a fibrous dysplasia lesion of the central skull base. It may be a lot more confusing uh, if we have these sclerotic and cystic components of fibrous dysplasia. But again, here's that same case on CT we see on MR. Some very dark areas, some bright areas on the T2, and very avid heterogeneous enhancement on MR. So you can see if we had started with the MR on this case, we might be having a lot of discussions about very aggressive osseous tumors rather than fibrous dysplasia in that case. Now here's another example, another important differential uh, when we think about uh, the osseous changes that may happen if they extend from the central skull base over to the temporal bone. We think about this otic capsule, densest bone in the body here around the cochlea. So we see the basal turn and the upper turns of the cochlea. This pathology is going right through the otic capsule, should be bright white all the way around the cochlea. So this is something that's violating that otic capsule. And it turns out that osteodystrophia deformans or pagets, where we have the waves of osteoblastic and osteoclastic activity that cause what's sometimes called the cotton wool appearance is very different than the expansile ground glass of fibrous dysplasia. But also, fibrous dysplasia has relative preservation of the otic capsule. So we still see all that dense bone around the cochlea, the vestibule, and the semicircular canals with fibrous dysplasia. But with osteodystrophia deformans or Paget's disease, we have violation of the otic capsule. So pagets will go right through the otic capsule, whereas fibrous dysplasia will have relative preservation frequently of the otic capsule. Densest bone in the body should be bright white around the cochlea and the vestibule. So that's another good differentiator for us for these pathologies. So another uh, fibrous dysplasia case. So we like to see the ground glass and expansile changes when that involves the central skull base, but we may also see cystic areas within the bone we don't want that to sway us. If we see that ground glass expansile changes, that's great for fibrous dysplasia in these pathologies. So next we have metastatic le lesions, the next most common. So here we just have a marrow replacing process. So we have a big differential. METS, myeloma, lymphoma, leukemia, plasma cytoma, EG, sarcoid. We have a wide differential if we have a patient with a marrow replacing process. So whatever that patient has a history of, that's what we're gonna think about whenever we see a pathology that is replacing the normal marrow. And again, this is a case where the pre-contrasted T1 might be more helpful because we see the normal bright marrow over here, but here we have a marrow replacing process. If this patient has a known history of a primary tumor with metastatic disease, we're gonna think about METs in these cases. So here's a pre-contrasted T1. So if you see a lot of patients with dental amalgam, we may get some artifact around the teeth, but I see the turbinates are dark, so I remember the nose nose. This is a pre-contrasted T1. I want to see all that bright fat that we talked about around the superhighway neck, but also in the skull base, I want to see bright, marrow, normal fat in the mastoid process as well as within the central skull base. And here I have a marrow replacing process. If this patient has a known primary with metastatic disease, I'm going to think that's probably most likely in this case that we have a metastatic focus to the central skull base. So next we have meningioma. Uh, we like to think about these as the most common extraaxial dural base mass in adults. We often see these in elderly female patients. We like to see uniform enhancement on either CT or MRI. 
we sometimes see calcifications within this and we see a hyperostatic reaction in the adjacent bone. Uh, that is more common than a permeative destructive pattern with meningiomas. On MRI, usually these are uh, iso intense to brain on the pre-contrasted sequences, uh, but we have avid enhancement after contrast and they may be bright on T2. Now, uh, meningiomas, if they happen along different dural surfaces or if they happen within bone, may give us very different appearances. So here's an axial post-contrasted T1. Nose is bright here, the nose nose. So this is after contrast. I see a lot of enhancement in the cavernous sinus where we should have valveless venous sinusoids, but I also have an extra axial dural based mass with small dural tails that may happen along the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. So that is a good appearance for a meningioma with these dural tails extending along the dural surfaces. Now those may extend along any foramen around the skull base. So the meningioma, as it has its dural tails, may extend along any foramen to may escape the skull or extend towards the orbit. When the meningioma happens within the bone, it can be much more confusing. What we sometimes call an intraosseous meningioma may look a lot like the marrow replacing processes that we talk about, including metastatic disease. So it may be more confusing if we have a meningioma that's centered within the central skull base. Uh, also, we have meningiomas that may happen within the lateral wall of the orbit. That's a very common location for an intraosseous meningioma. If we just look at the osseous component, it may look very aggressive, especially if we do a lot of MSK imaging, we may think about much more aggressive lesions like a sunburst appearance of a telangiectatic osteosarcoma. But if we look at the soft tissue component, we see a very benign margin, a non-aggressive margin of this meningioma. So the osseous changes may look very aggressive, but the soft tissue component may look very benign. And the lateral wall of the orbit is a very common location for intraosseous meningiomas. So we wanna remember that when we see a lesion in this region. Multiple myeloma is another pathology that we may see around the central skull base. Uh, that imaging may be similar to a plasma cytoma and we see these osteolytic changes and what looks sometimes like extra foramen, it looks like there are too many holes in the central skull base. So we see multiple lesions in these areas. So in addition, say to foramen and frame, uh, foramen ovale and spinosum, we might see what looks like extra foramen as we see these osteolytic lesions of the skull base in a patient with known multiple myeloma. If we have a larger lesion, we might think about plasma cytoma in these cases. Next, we have lymphoma. We think about lymphoma as a great mimicker, could have a lot of different appearances. This may show up as a dural-based extraaxial mass. It may be within the brain itself. It may cross the midline through the corpus callosum. If we see a solid lesion that's crossing the midline through the corpus, we think about those dense fiber crossing tracks. Not a lot of things will do that. So if it's homogeneously enhancing, we may think about lymphoma but that lymphoma may also present as a dural-based mass similar to a meningioma, or it may appear as a primary intraosseous lesion. So it may be very different, uh, difficult to differentiate a lymphoma from a metastatic focus or other marrow replacing processes. So we have a wide range of appearances with lymphoma, and we'd like to see these uniformly enhancing. Uh, dural-based disease is relatively common in patients with known lymphoma but it can be intraosseous, and we may see very aggressive destructive changes with extensive soft tissue masses in these cases. So if I have a lesion of the central skull base that looks like it may be extending into the cavernous sinuses, maybe into the prepontine cistern, I think about that big differential for uh, a marrow replacing process. So METS, myeloma, lymphoma, leukemia, plasma, cytoma, EG, a wide differential for these pathologies. But if I know that patient has a history of lymphoma, I want to remember that that's a possibility here. And this is an area where we may pay attention to both the T2 and the ADC sequences because both T2 and ADC are rough markers of tumor cellularity for us. And both meningiomas and lymphomas may be very dark on T2 and ADC. So this is an area where we may use the diffusion and ADC sequence that we often talk about with ischemia intracranially we may use those sequences in the extracranial head and neck as a rough marker of tumor cellularity. We're not using that in those cases in terms of restricted diffusion. We're only looking at the ADC 
as a rough marker of tumor cellularity in those cases. Here's another case, uh, intraosseous lesion of the central skull base. It looks a lot like that intraosseous meningioma we discussed before, but we see more soft tissue component as this extends into the cavernous sinuses adjacent to the cavernous carotid on this post-contrasted axial T1. It's going back and filling the trigeminal cisterns on both sides, and it's extending into the prepontine cistern. Interestingly, with lymphoma as an internal standard, lymphoma, especially when we see it intranasally, often enhances less than the nasal mucosa and the turbinates. So we can see that this intraosseous lymphoma in this case is enhancing much less than the contrast we see in the blood vessels, and it's enhancing less than the nasal mucosa adjacent to it. So as another internal standard, we like this to be very dark on the T2, very dark on the ADC, but as an internal comparison standard on the post-contrasted lymphoma, especially when it shows up as an intranasal mass, will enhance less than the nasal mucosa and the turbinates. That's an important differentiator for us. Next is nasopharyngeal carcinoma. So one of the things we want to remember when we have a central midline skull base pathology is we want to look below and look at the nasopharyngeal tissues because we can have a nasopharyngeal carcinoma, which is just a squamous cell carcinoma arising from the nasopharynx, or we can have a minor salivary gland carcinoma or lymphoma of the nasopharynx that extends up. There may be direct extension through the skull base into the cavernous sinus. We can have perineural tumor spread along V3 or V2 to get intracranially, or we may have perivascular spread extending along the horizontal segment of the carotid. Those are different patterns for nasopharyngeal carcinoma to extend to the central skull base. So here's another case. It looks very similar to that intraosseous meningioma and lymphoma that we discussed before. But if I look below this case and I see this enhancing lesion on this axial post-contrasted MR with fat saturation, this is extending laterally into the trigeminal cistern or Meckel's cave. But if I look below and I see that there's actually a large nasopharyngeal mass that is connecting to this, I want to remember nasopharyngeal carcinoma, lymphoma, and minor salivary gland tumors that may arise from the nasopharynx and extend up superiorly into that central skull base. Now, we want to look below, but we also want to look above. It is possible to get a pituitary macroadenoma that extend, instead of extending superiorly, it may be aggressive and extend inferiorly into the clivus and the central skull base. So it's, it's very important on the sagittal midline images to look above and see, do we see a normal pituitary gland separate from the lesion we see of the central skull base? So an abnormal pituitary is very important here. Uh, so we may see extension superiorly, laterally, and inferiorly from a macroadenoma. So we think about pituitary macroadenomas normally extending superiorly in the supercellar cistern. We often see the optic chiasm draped over the gland itself. And we think about that diaphragma cella being intact, that diaphragm and, uh, above the pituitary gland itself, that gives the neurosurgeons comfort when they go transphenoidally to resect this tumor from below without being in danger of hurting the optic chiasm draped above because that diaphragma cella is still supposed to be intact between the optic chiasm and the pituitary macroadenoma. So normally macroadenomas extend superiorly, but we know that we can see them extend laterally into the cavernous sinus, like we see in this case, instead of superiorly, or they can stand, extend inferiorly. So here in this graphic, we see a lesion from the pituitary itself extending inferiorly into the central skull base and clivus. So we can have a, an aggressive pituitary macroadenoma that extends inferiorly down. So here's a case very similar to that unknown case we started with, where we have a large lesion destroying the central skull base and clivus. So we want to try to look very closely. Is there normal bone that's left behind? Is our tumor destroying bone? Or do we have a, a tumor or a pathology that's actually making a matrix of the central skull base when we're thinking about our differential? So anytime we see a central skull base midline pathology, I want to look above and see, is there a normal pituitary gland separate from this lesion? or does it look like the infundibulum goes down and connects to this lesion itself? Now, theoretically, people have described a, a aggressive pituitary macroadenoma that extends down, and they've hypothesized maybe you might see a normal pituitary above that, but I've never seen a case like that. 
all the pituitary macroadenomas that were aggressive extending into the central skull base, we did not see a normal pituitary above the lesion. So we want to look above, is there normal pituitary? And we want to look up below, do we see normal nasopharyngeal tissues anytime we have a central midline skull base pathology? So next we have arachnoid granulations. If you have a lot of intracranial hypertension patients, especially if you see a lot of morbid obesity in your patient population, you may see a lot of these lesions along the dural sinuses and dural surfaces. They may be tumefactive and have strange enhancement when they're large, but we think about well-defined non-enhancing lytic lesions of the central skull base. So again, similar to that multimyeloma case, it looks like we have extra foramen along the central skull base itself. So we try to find ovale and spinosum, but here it looks like we have extra foramen. So if this patient has known intracranial hypertension and we see prominent CSF along the optic nerves and a partial empty cella, other findings of intracranial hypertension, we might think about arachnoid granulations in this case, and we might do an MR to see if these follow CSF signal intensity uh, to confirm arachnoid granulations that we might more commonly see along the dural venous sinuses in the posterior fossa. Uh, next, we have dendritic cell histiocytosis or Langerhans. Uh, so maybe a multifocal disease. We might see this uh, involving the infundibulum in the cella and the pituitary region. Uh, we look for a destructive mass. And again, this is one of our bigger differentials, Langerhans or dendritic cell histiocytosis, uh, when we think about a marrow replacing process. So we look very closely to see if there's infundibular or cellar disease to help us differentiate a dendritic cell histiocytosis or a Langerhans cell histiocytosis. So if we see a coronal CT like this, where we have a marrow replacing process of the central skull base, it looks like it's destroying bone with a soft tissue component. If that patient has a history of dendritic cell histiocytosis or Langerhans, we want to consider that in the differential. So next we have chordoma. Now we think about both chordomas and chondrosarcomas as being very bright on T2, but we like the chordoma to be a midline central skull base pathology with destructive changes. Uh, so we think about these bony spicules that might be left behind with an aggressive chordoma of the central skull base. Now cranial nerve six is going right by the central skull base uh, into its own canal under the petroclinoid ligament or Gruber's ligament and through its own cistern or Dorello's canal. Uh, so that's right near the central skull base. So a chordoma may present with a six nerve palsy. So if we know the patient has a six nerve palsy and they have a central midline skull base lesion that's expansile and bright on T2, we're going to think about a chordoma in those cases. So here's a graphic that shows a central skull base lesion but we have a normal pituitary separate from our mass. And these lesions often go back posteriorly and they push on the pons or thumb the pons back posteriorly. And we might see osseous fragments bone left behind within these lesions. So here's a case, here's a correlating nice axial T2. We have a T2 bright lesion that's expansile off the back wall of the central skull base. And we see how it thumbs the pons and it pushes the basilar artery off midline. That's a good appearance for a chordoma. When we think about these in the sagittal plane, we're going to think about a normal pituitary above and normal nasopharyngeal tissue below, separate from our lesion that may have bony flex left behind. And it's sometimes hard to tell, do we have a lesion that's destroying bone, but there are some bony spicules that are left behind, or do we have a lesion that's actually making an osseous matrix in itself? So here's a nice correlating case. Here's a T1 pre-contrasted sagittal midline. We have a lesion of the central skull base. We have a normal pituitary lifted above. We have normal nasopharyngeal tissues below, but the lesion does thumb the pons, helping us with our differential. And we like those to be very bright on T2, helping us make the diagnosis of a chordoma in that case. When we give contrast, sometimes there's very heterogeneous appearance, as we see in this case on this sagittal midline post-contrasted T1. We see how it's going back and thumbing the pons but we have a normal pituitary lifted above and we have normal nasopharyngeal mucosal surfaces below. We want to differentiate that chordoma from a macroadenoma. Here, the infundibulum connects to our mass, but here we see a normal pituitary lifted above the mass itself. 
So that helps us differentiate an aggressive pituitary macroadenoma that's going down and invading the skull base from a chordoma lesion that's arising from the skull base and lifting the pituitary gland superiorly. So next we have osteodystrophia deformans or Paget's disease. Uh, we think about these waves of osteoplastic and osteoclastic activity that cause a mixed lytic and sclerotic pattern that's often called cotton wool appearance with expansile changes to the bone, more commonly seen in men. So here's a nice example of that cotton wool appearance to the central skull base. And we think about these waves of osteoblastic and osteoclastic activity that are seen in osteodystrophia deformans or Paget's disease. Next, we have chondrosarcoma. So similar to chordoma, these are bright on T2 and expansile. They may go back and push on the brain or thumb the pons. Uh, we think about the petrooccipital fissure as being the most common site of origin. So these are arising off midline at the lateral fissure. Uh, we think about 50% uh, of these having arcs and whirls of calcifications, the chondroid matrix. But in reality, this number is taken from the spine literature. In my cases, at least, I see the chondroid calcifications much less commonly. It's probably closer to 20 or 25 percent in my cases at my shop. Uh, but we see very bright T2 signal and intense enhancement on the T1 images. So here in this graphic, we see a lesion that's centered off midline at that petrooccipital suture. That's where we think about chondrosarcoma as being centered. And we have a T2 bright mass here that nicely correlates with that graphic. We sometimes see them going back and thumbing the pons or the peduncle posteriorly, but they're very bright on the T2. So we differentiate a chordoma, an expansile T2 bright midline lesion that's thumbing the pons. We differentiate that with a chondrosarcoma, also T2 bright, also expansile, also may go back and kind of push on the pons and the midbrain, but it's centered off midline, different than the chordoma being centered at midline. So here's a nice case, uh, very similar to that prior one, where it's very bright on the T2, it's expansile, it's centered off midline at that suture, it's going back and kind of thumbing uh, the pons and the medulla at this level, and very avidly enhancing uh, for a chondrosarcoma in that case. Uh, here's a nice case where we see that chondroid matrix, if you haven't seen that or described it before. It's been described in the literature as about half of skull-based chondrosarcomas have the chondroid matrix, in my cases at my shop, it's much less. It's probably closer to 25%. I think that that number 50% is actually just taken from the spine literature and applied to skull-based pathology. So that's a review of the pathology we see. So we've come full circle and we're back now to our unknown case. So I sat down with my fellow who looked at this case and I looked at the differential for his report and I went through and tried to rule out and rule in all these pathologies and uh, try to get to a much more specific diagnosis. Uh, so they had this wide differential of a lot of different pathologies uh, that they had in their report. These are all the things that they listed in their impression. So I tried to go down and, and think about how we use logic and rationality to get to the right answer in this case. So we looked above. Now, I think that I see a normal pituitary above separate from this lesion. So I can rule out the aggressive pituitary macroadenoma. And when we looked at all the images, it looked like we had a normal nasopharyngeal mucosal surface below. So I think we can rule out the nasopharyngeal carcinoma. And we had actually done T2-weighted imaging. And you see here, it's very dark on the T2. So that, to me, implies a hypercellularity. So I'm probably going to rule out both the chordoma and chondrosarcoma because I expect both of those to be very bright on T2. So I can rule those out. And we did actually measure ADC values on this, and it was very low, it was 0.6. Uh, this number, if we measure the region of interest, we try to avoid the outside of the lesion, and we try to avoid cystic areas, but we can measure the region of interest, and we get a very low number here. This number is times 10 to the negative 3 uh, millimeters squared per second. That's the MRI physics variable, uh, but this is 0.6, so that's very low. So that implies a hypercellularity to this lesion. And we'd actually done a CT. And if we look closely on the CT, it looked like there were a bunch of extra holes on this lesion. So I said, well, you know, I, I see all these lesions. And so I have one big lesion that's very hypercellular. And then I have a lot of lytic lesions of the central skull base. So I think this might be a good appearance for a patient with multiple myeloma and a plasma cytoma. So that's why I, I think about that is probably most likely for this differential. 
and I, I sat to and went through this case, and I think it was a very nice example of how we can think about the imaging characteristics of these pathologies. And when I went through this differential uh, with my student, a couple of weeks later, they uh, stopped and told me that they had biopsied the lesion, and it turned out that was correct. It was a plasma cytoma. But I think this case was a very nice example of how if we try to stay objective and we think with logic and rationality to try to reach the right conclusion, we can sometimes get the right, right diagnosis if we remember the complex imaging findings we see in these very complicated cases. So this case turned out to be a nice example of a plasma cytoma in this patient with multimyeloma that had all these extra lytic lesions of the skull base. So that's a review of, of the anatomy and the pathology of this very complicated area of the central skull base. So I, I think we want to try to remember to both look above and look below. Is there normal pituitary above our lesion? And do we see normal nasopharyngeal tissues below? We want to remember that all those fiber osseous lesions are common in these cases. And we want to try to think about where the center of the lesion is. And is it making a matrix or is that just bone that's left behind as the pathology is destroying the central skull base? And we also look for cranial nerves. Are there any cranial nerves involved? And we remember all these complicated foramen around the central skull base in this area. So that is a review of, of the anatomy and pathology and kind of a nice example of how an unknown case, if we try to think and stay objectively about these imaging findings, we can sometimes get to the right diagnosis. And I thank you very much for your attention. Rick, thank you very much for this very uh, good and plain uh, lecture based on anatomy is king. Um, our boxes are open now, so the uh, attendees can uh, submit questions on email, which will come up on your inbox. Um, for um, our attendees, the central skull base is so important because from an ENT surgery point of view, there is an uh, increasing number of surgeons that uh, perform endoscopic skull-based resections. Um, we have a, a, a very prestigious unit at the University of Cape Town under the leadership of Professor Darlene Libber it actually approaches this skull-based trance orbitally and they are absolutely dependent on accurate anatomic uh, localizations and descriptions and margins of tumors. So, and the um, expertise in technology of endoscopic skull-based surgery is spreading uh, more widely. So, even if you're not a dedicated head and neck, radiologist, you might get surprised uh, when there is a skull-based surgeon in your hospital that you didn't know about. So again, uh, first of all, anatomy is king. Secondly, the anatomy is uh, absolutely important in perineural tumor spread and head and neck cancers, uh, cranial nerve 7 and 5 and anastomosis. And then large uh, it is so important to understand the embryology of the central skull base which is so well demonstrated by the differentiation between chondrosarcomas and cordovas um, is there anything in the inbox yeah there are a couple of questions uh, some people talked okay. about the adc and the t2 so if we just have a marrow replacing process, we've got a wide differential there. METS, myeloma, lymphoma, leukemia, plasma, cytoma, EG, sarcoid. But specifically, when we think about using the T2 and the ADC as a rough marker of tumor cellularity, meningioma, lymphoma, plasma, cytoma, metastatic disease, those are all things that we'd like to be uh, very dark on the ADC because we think about them as hypercellular. There are some metastatic disease that are hypocellular. So sometimes METs, 
may be bright on T2, especially when we think about them in the spine. When we're doing those workups, we look for the bright T2 and stir signal, but they're dark on T1 and they enhance on T1 after contrast. Uh, so for us, we think about the ADC as a rough marker of tumor cellularity. We remember that if it's dark on ADC, that implies a hypercellularity, but that's different than being malignant. There are some pathologies like meningioma and lymphoma that we think about as benign entities in terms of less than five mitotic figures per high-powered field on path, but they are also hypercellular. So meningiomas and lymphomas can be very dark on T2 and ADC, but they're not necessarily malignant. Uh, so we want to remember that in those pathologies. Uh, yeah, so uh, Kenneth asked about hypercellularity with low ADC. We think about this as being uh, different than restricted diffusion. So with ischemia, we have restricted diffusion that we think about an infarction as bright on diffusion and dark on ADC. Uh, here, we're not really talking about restricted diffusion when we're using the ADC and the extracranial head and neck in terms of evaluating hypercellularity. Uh, so that's very different. Uh, the, the reason that it's dark on ADC is because of the molecular properties of the ADC and the imaging that we do. So we think about that as different from restricted diffusion with ischemia and infarction within the brain parenchyma itself. Uh, can geographical fatty change be caused in the skull base in a 13-year-old with chronic treatments? Uh, we can have uh, different fatty changes in the marrow. Uh, so just like if somebody has a diffuse marrow placing process, uh, like if they have lymphoma or leukemia or diffuse METs that we might see in a patient with prostate cancer and diffuse metastatic disease, uh, those can all change, uh, cause a marrow placing process. We sometimes talk about brown marrow. Uh, or uh, marrow being different and might be confusing in nuclear medicine studies. Uh, I think that we can see different fatty changes in the marrow. Uh, that's kind of a different discussion we sometimes talk about with uh, marrow in the spine, uh, but the same things that can cause a marrow uh, fatty change in the spine can cause differences in the skull base. And again, we think about that basis sphenoid and clivus as embryologically uh, being similar to a vertebral body, uh, so we get the same kind of pathology in the central skull base and clivus. Uh, Clive asked about IgG4. Yeah, depending on your patient population, if you see these, again, IgG4 is thought of as a, a big differential, so we have a lot of marrow replacing processes uh, that may be similar to IgG4. It's especially confusing sometimes around the orbit as well as the central skull base, in a patient who may have IgG4 disease as a marrow replacing process. Just like lymphoma and leukemia, that may be a great mimicker. IgG4 can be a soft tissue mass in the orbit and the extracranial head and neck, or it may show up similar to a marrow replacing process in the central skull base. That's a good point, Clyde. Well, uh, sorry uh, for my coming here, um, Rick. Uh, how often do you see IgG4? Uh, it's pretty rare, uh, but it, we think about it sometimes in the differential. And uh, I will say that often it shows up kind of as a surprise uh, when we see a, a vague soft tissue mass in the postseptal soft tissues or within the central skull base. Uh, we think about the more common entities first. Uh, so it is it is something that we may sometimes include in the differential, uh, but it's much more rare to patient on, depending on your patient uh, population. Um, no, no, just in my experience, the few that I've seen is that what has always alerted me is that T1 and T2 extremely hypo intense. Yeah. As it tends to uh, muscle enhancing, right. and uh, that usually alerts me as to uh, unusual uh, tumors is, is the T1, T2 hypo intensity or high intensity right. muscle. Any, any more questions? Nope, that's all I've gotten. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rick, and uh, thank you very much for uh, allowing us to record this uh, webinar, which will be available on our website for our members on the secure website, and we will send the recording to you uh, early tomorrow morning. Thank you Great. very thank much. Thank you very much. Audience, and, uh, we'll
uh, talk in a few weeks' time. Thank you very much, Rick. Take care. Bye.